I welcome you all for the session on drug effects on ECG. This is one of the topics that we have in our program on interpretation and application of ECG in clinical practice. We know pretty well that ECG is one of the crucial investigative parameters. We usually take it for patients who have cardiac disease or people who complain of chest pain or you know angina and there are few things when a patient is complaining then we'll be interested to take ECG and based on the findings in the ECG we'll try to you know um, arrive at uh, uh, diagnosis um, or you know that will indicate us to guess few you know disorders which are related to heart. Now in this session we are going to see uh, the drugs the various drugs which can cause changes in ECG um, so that by, by you know getting into oh, you know the clinical spectrum of problems that the patients are having we will arrive at a proper diagnosis and we can also you know uh, treat them accordingly. Now for the sake of this presentation I have actually categorized the drugs into four. The reason is that there are few drugs which affect um, you know heart straight away and they change the electrophysiology and they modify the ECG pattern. They are directly acting drugs. We have other drugs, let us say drugs which uh, you know do not actually act on heart but still they produce changes in the ECG through reflex mechanisms or you know uh, we, we call them as indirectly acting drugs uh, which affect ECG. Then we have non-cardiac medications. You see here um, non-cardiac medications uh, they may be antimicrobials, they may be antidepressants or antipsychotic drugs. They also you know act through some non-specific mechanisms and they change the ECG pattern. And then finally we have uh, drugs of abuse, uh, you know drugs we use for recreational purpose or non-medical purpose. They also affect heart and then we get changes in the ECG. So these are you know uh, broadly I have classified the drugs that affect ECG into four. Now we are into the drugs that act directly on heart, heart let us say myocardial muscle or conducting system you know they have various um, you know receptors and channels um, and we have drugs which could you know um, stimulate or inhibit these receptors and you know channels and thereby we get a lot of uh, changes in the electrophysiology and then we ultimately see changes in the ECG. The um, crucial receptors and channels I have listed here. Uh, we have sympathetic receptors, um, you know we have uh, adrenergic and uh, you know noradrenergic and system and uh, we have alpha and beta receptors in it, and beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 and then alpha 1 and alpha 2. In, in um, you know myocardium we have predominantly beta 1 receptor located. We also have parasympathetic receptors, cholinergic receptors. Basically, we classify cholinergic receptors into muscarinic and nicotinic. But in heart, what we see is uh, you know M2, muscarinic 2 type receptor, uh, which is predominantly seen in heart, both in myocardial muscle and in, in the conducting system. Then we have calcium channels, L type calcium channels, and then sodium channels, and then potassium channels, and then myocardial membrane has got sodium potassium ATPS, which is an enzyme. So these are the potential targets for drugs, and these drugs acting on various receptors and channels in the heart, they you know facilitate changes in the myocardium. Sometimes you know these changes may be inert. We may not have significant clinical you know outcomes of it, but sometimes these ch these changes may be dangerous and may be. Uh, you know serious and uh, which can give uh, you know significant cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Now we are into the drugs which could affect ECG based on you know their action somewhere else mostly let us say blood vessels, uh, arteries and veins and uh, you know by acting on those arteries and veins we could get changes in the ECG. Uh, these drugs may not straight away act on myocardium to bring in changes in the ECG. Okay, that is why we put them as you know indirectly acting drugs or you know uh, drugs uh, through reflex mechanisms they, they produce changes in the ECG. Ganglion stimulants, I am going to the last one, you know uh, we have atomic ganglia, drugs acting on those ganglia will, will release catecholamines and these catecholamines you know uh, through reflex mechanisms act on, in heart and uh, they bring in changes, ganglionic stimulants. Uh, and then we have lot of vasodilators, you see here vasodilators, many of them are going to act on 
uh, arteries and a few of them will be acting on uh, you know veins and then um, you know we will have vasodilatation maybe arterial dilatation or venodilatation and then uh, through reflex mechanisms uh, you know catecholamines may be released and they may produce changes in the ECG. Uh, most importantly we have calcium channel blockers. Uh, and then alpha blockers again sympathetic uh, we were we have seen sympathetic receptors alpha and beta here alpha uh, one receptor blockers um, they, they produce significant vasodilatation reduction in the blood pressure and they may change uh, the ECG pattern. And then nitrates are venodilators potassium channel openers and AC inhibitors angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, uh, AC inhibitors are good to heart, uh, they do not significantly change the ECG, but sometimes in the peripheral vasodilatation through refle reflex mechanisms we may have you know changes in the ECG. The third category drugs I have already told that uh, they are mostly non-cardiac medications, maybe antibiotics, maybe you know antipsychotics, um, maybe antifungal drugs okay, or drugs acting in the GA tract, uh, they are non-cardiac drugs and most of these drugs may increase uh, QT interval you know and they may cause sometimes polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. You now these category of drugs they, they bring in changes through non-specific mechanisms and then uh, the fourth category we have drugs of abuse you know we use drugs uh, not you know sometimes people are you know getting tempted to use drugs for recreational purposes, um, non-medical purposes. They get habituated and they started using you know amphetamines, opioids, cocaine and cannabis and uh, they may also cause you know serious um, electrophysiological changes in the heart and uh, ultimately you know the pe people who are using it may suffer with uh, significant cardiac uh, morbidity. Now we are actually going ahead with um, the individual drugs, um, how they affect uh, the ECG and what are the exact changes we will get to see in ECG if we are using those medications and the mechanisms by which these drugs are going to cause uh, you know ECG changes. We have beta 1 receptor and we know pretty well that beta 1 receptors are located everywhere in heart. Let us say um, endocardium it is there and uh, you know. Uh, myocardium it is there and conducting system everywhere it is present beta 1 receptors and it is basically a stimulatory receptor that is why we call them as GS um, you know receptor and uh, uh, there are drugs there are uh, neurotransmitters that st will stimulate beta 1 receptors and similarly there are drugs and neurotransmitters that will inhibit uh, beta 1 receptors. If, if something is stimulating beta 1 receptor, it, it increases force of contraction, it increases rate of contraction and uh, you see increased uh, cardiac output and increased heart rate. And similarly, if, if you have something which is inhibiting beta 1 receptors, um, you know um, it, it causes reduction in the heart rate and reduction in the force of contraction, conductivity and then reduction in the cardiac output. We have uh, drugs that stimulate beta 1 receptors uh, like adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline, isoprenaline and dobutamine. Isoprenaline and dobutamine they are cardiac stimulants, we use them in case we have shock, we have you know cardiogenic shock and cardiogenic failure sometimes we use them. Noradrenaline again in severe hypotension and cardiogenic shock we are using adrenaline, we use it for anaphylaxis and then we use it uh, again in um, you know uh, cardiac arrest and cardiogenic shock they are life saving medications and without proper reason if you are using them they may be dangerous also because uh, you know uh, they are going to stimulate heart and uh, for no reason if you are stimulating heart with these powerful pharmacological agents uh, you know we may even have you know uh, myocardial infarction. We have seen patients you know getting treated for allergy with adrenaline going for uh, you know acute myocardial infarction. Uh, basically these drugs cause tachycardia. You see the heart rate is increased more than 100, the normal heart rate is about 60 to 100 and all these medications uh, that are stimulating beta 1 receptor may cause increased heart rate that we call it tachycardia and ECG will give us the heart rate of 100 and more 120, 140 or even 200 we can get the heart rate in the ECG and sometimes they also cause a reduction in the T wave amplitude and they also you know increase uh, QT interval. These are the ECG changes that we commonly encounter when we are using drugs that stimulate beta 1 receptors. And we have drugs that block beta 1 receptors. Uh, you know um, we have non-selective blockers, uh, 
uh, you know, you have beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 receptors. And uh, from pharmacological action point of view, we mainly use drugs that modulate beta 1 and beta 2. And uh, we have non-selective beta blockers, like they block both beta 1 and beta 2. Drugs like Sotelol, Pindalol, and Nadolol, they block both beta 1 and beta 2. And we have selective beta 1 blockers, like metoprolol, atinolol, seliprolol, esmolol, and acibutolol. They do not have significant action on beta 2 receptor. They only act on beta 1 receptors and they block beta 1 receptors. And what are the changes beta 1 inhibition brings in ECG? Uh, we know, uh, you know, uh, beta 1 stimulation is stimulating heart and beta 1 inhibition is inhibiting heart. So, the heart rate is going to come down force of contraction is going to come down, cardiac output is going to come down. And hence, what we see in ECG is bradycardia and AV block, AV node uh, is located between atria and ventricle and the impulses are transmitted from SA node through, uh, um, you know, AV node to uh, the ventricles and all other zones in the myocardium. So, if, if we are using beta 1 blockers, they, they bring in AV block and they also reduce heart rate and we get bradycardia. And sometimes they also cause prolongation of PR interval, QRS widening they cause and uh, you know prolongation of QTC interval, okay. So, whenever a patient is receiving beta 1 blockers, these ECG changes may happen, okay. Now, we are uh, going to uh, M2 receptor, you know muscarinic 2 type receptor, uh, you know the neurotransmitter uh, endogenously present to modulate muscarinic activity is uh, acetylcholine which is secreted from the parasympathetic or cholinergic uh, neurons. And these receptors are located in myocardial muscle and conducting system. It is basically inhibitory in nature, so it goes with GI receptor. And again we have drugs and um, you know mediators that stimulate M2 receptors and then that inhibits um, you know M2 receptors. And if we stimulate M2 receptor, um, you know uh, we get a reduction in the heart rate, we get reduction in the force of contraction and conductivity. And similarly, if we inhibit muscarinic receptors, M2 receptors to be uh, you know more precisely putting it here, if we inhibit M2 receptors, we get increased heart rate, meaning that we can have tachycardia and we may also have increased force of contraction and conductivity. Now, what are the drugs that stimulate M2 receptors? We have uh, directly acting cholinomimetics like pilocarpine and these drugs stimulate uh, M2 receptors straight away. Whereas, we have other drugs which indirectly you know stimulate M2 receptors, they are indirectly acting cholinomimetics, they do not act on the receptors, uh, rather they you know, um, you know inhibit um, an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. This is the enzyme that metabolizes acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the cholinergic uh, neurotransmitter. And if you could inhibit the enzyme that destroys acetylcholine, what happens is that, um, you know, um, the levels of acetylcholine in the synapse will be more, will be increased. And this enhanced acetylcholine will, will be stimulating too much these M2 receptors and uh, uh, then you will have all cholinergic activity. That is why these drugs like physostigmine, neostigmine, pyridostigmine, donapazil, uh, rivastigmine and galantamine, these drugs, they are called as indirectly acting cholinomimetics because they are not acting on receptors as such. They only block acetylcholinesterase enzyme. And here if you see uh, galantamine and rivastigmine, they are used in Alzheimer's disease. Again, in donapazil is used in Alzheimer's disease, you know, memory loss and old age, um, senile dementia, bigetna. And uh, physostigmine, neostigmine, pyrostigmine, they have got a lot of uh, therapeutic potential in various conditions. Now, what are the ECG changes we get when we are stimulating M2 receptor? Like we have already discussed that it is going to be inhibitory in nature. We get bradycardia, we get AV nodal block, most commonly first degree AV nodal block. And then we also get prolongation of PR interval, RR interval and QTC interval. So, if a patient is receiving uh, drugs for Alzheimer's disease, his ECG may go for these changes. M2 inhibition, anticholinergics they are called. We have atropine, we have hyosin, iprotropium. Iprotropium is an anticholinergic drug that we use for bronchial asthma. And then we have tropicamide, it is used as eye drops, uh, you know, for uh, when we check uh, the vision, refraction, you know, we use tropicamide to dilate the pupils. And then pyranzepin is an anticholinergic that, uh, anticholinergic that is used for peptic ulcer. These anticholinergics may also affect uh, 
you know, heart because we have M2 receptor and these drugs may sometimes have, you know, minimal effect on M2 receptors and they inhibit M2 receptors and what ultimately we have is that, you know, cardiac stimulation. We have tachycardia, the heart rate is increased and we have sometimes AV nodal block and, you know, reduction in the, uh, you know, duration of PR interval and sometimes you will also have flattening of T wave. Then I think we have calcium channels. Calcium channels are seen everywhere in muscles, wherever we have contraction, maybe intestinal smooth muscle, maybe skeletal muscle, or maybe in myocardium, everywhere we have calcium channels. In myocardium, we have L-type calcium channel. It is present in myocardial muscle and also in conducting system, we have uh, L-type calcium channel. What it does is that it increases whenever we stimulate these calcium channels, whenever we have more entry of calcium into the muscle, it causes increased muscle contraction. And we have drugs that block these calcium channels, specifically in myocardium. We have drugs like verapamil and diltiazem. Um, you know, um, it, it leads to inhibition of cardiac contractility. So what happens is that the heart rate is coming down. Um, it causes bradycardia, AV block, a widening of QRS complex and then cardiac asystole which is very dangerous, the patient may even die out of it, okay. And these drugs are antiarrhythmic drugs, verapamil and diltiazem and many of the antiarrhythmic drugs, you know, they by nature, you know, they are going to bring in a lot of changes in the ECG because their site of action is heart and hence uh, naturally they are going to affect the cardiac electrophysiology and we will have a lot of ECG changes. Sodium channel. Um, you know, these channels are present in the myocardial muscle and conducting system. Uh, what it does is that it, it causes a rapid upstroke of cardiac action potential and impulse conduction. And uh, we have drugs that block sodium channels, uh, you know, they are called sodium channel blockers and we actually subcategorize them into three types, you know, sodium channel blockers class 1A. 1B and then 1C. They are basically, you know, anti-arrhythmic drugs. When, when the rhythm of the heart is already, you know, um, uh, you know, affected and uh, there is dysrhythmia or there is abnormal rhythm of the myocardium, we will be using several, you know, anti-arrhythmic drugs to set the rhythm to bring back, uh, you know, uh, it to a normal rhythm, you know, regularly regular. Whenever this regularly regular rhythm is altered due to some reasons, we will be using drugs to bring the rhythm back, you know. Uh, for that purpose, we may be using sodium channel blockers and now. Class 1A drugs, they block the sodium channel in open state and they also produce prolongation of action potential. They are associated with prolongation of action potential. We have class 1B drugs, you know, they are sodium channel blockers. They block the sodium channel in inactivated state. At the same time, they also reduce or shorten the action potential. We have class 1C drugs, they block the sodium channel in open state like class 1A drugs, but they do not have significant effect on the action potential, okay. Now, what are the drugs we have um, as sodium channel blockers and what is the effect these drugs bring in, uh, you know, um, in the electrophysiology and ultimately in the ECG tracings. Class 1A drugs, we have drugs like quinidine. Um, you know, of course, like anti-malarial drug quinine, um, it is uh, an isom isomer or a stereomer uh, isomer of uh, quinine, quinidine. And then uh, procainamide, desopiramide, you know, these drugs are used in ventricular tachyarrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia and other ventricular arrhythmias. And uh, these drugs produce prolonged PR interval, QT interval, and they also widen the QRS complex. Class 1B drugs. Lidocaine, the same local anesthetic that we are using it, okay. And then mexilatin, they are used in again ventricular tachyarrhythmias. All sodium channel blockers are useful in ventricular tachyarrhythmias, uh, either class 1A or 1B or 1C. And the ECG changes also are pretty similar for all the classes of sodium channel blockers, 1A, 1B and 1C. Here again, they produce a prolonged PR interval, widening of QRS complex and shortening of RR interval. Then we have 1C drugs, flacanid and propofenone. Very many drugs for this presentation purpose, I have actually restricted the number of drugs that I am going to quote here. They are again used in, you know, uh, ventricular tachyarrhythmias and they produce bradycardia, first degree AV block, widening of QRS complex and A systole and which is a very significant cardiac morbidity in case if you are using these drugs and we need to be aware of the fact that these drugs may also produce cardiac A systole. Now we are moving to potassium channels. They are presenting, they are present in, uh, you know, conducting system of the heart mainly and uh, these potassium channels regulate 
resting membrane potential and also they, they try to regulate the frequency of SA node and indirectly you know that means that it can control the heart rate. Potassium channel blockers, we have drugs like amiodarone, pretilium and dofetilide. They are again used as antiarrhythmic drugs. Amiodarone is one of the broadest spectrum antiarrhythmic which can be used in any type of arrhythmia and it is used predominantly in ventricular tachycardia, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. And what these drugs uh, produce in ECG is that they usually prolong, uh, you know, QT interval or QTC interval. And this can sometimes lead to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or which is also known as TOS ADST pointers. Sodium potassium ATPS, it is present in the membrane of the myocardial muscle and, um, you know, um, it is a target for a drug, you know, age old medication that is used in cardiac failure, digoxin. And it is also present in the conducting system, AV node, SA node, everywhere it is present. What it does is that it tries to maintain low sodium and high potassium in the cell and also it maintains a resting membrane potential. And when we block this enzyme, you know, sodium potassium ATPs, digoxin does it. We have a lot of digoxin like drugs and many of these drugs what they do is that they increase the force of contraction. At the same time, they produce AV nodal block and they reduce the heart rate. So, digoxin like drugs are, you know, so unique, you know, they increase the heart, I mean, they increase the cardiac output, they increase the force of contraction. At the same time, they reduce heart rate, they, they reduce, uh, you know, uh, the conductivity of the impulses and they produce bradycardia, okay, which is very unusual for a drug, okay. Increased cardiac output at the same time bradycardia. They, they also produce significant ECG changes. For example, you take digoxin like drugs, practically they, ca they can cause any, any, any change in the ECG. They can cause atrial uh, premature beats, um, you know, functional premature beats, atrial tachycardia, AV block, premature ventricular beats and ventricular bigeminy. Now, I think we are moving towards indirectly acting drugs. What we have seen so far is, you know, the drugs that were acting directly on heart, on various receptors and channels and bringing in changes in the ECG. Now we are going to talk about drugs that act in the periphery, uh, vasodilators at the same time producing changes in the ECG. If you see here, calcium channel blockers, we are taking first, uh, they act, um, you know, um, in the arteries, smooth muscles, um, they are L-type calcium channel blockers, drugs like nifidipine, amlodipine, nicardipine and felodipine, they are used in hypertension. Uh, very popular in the treatment of hypertension, calcium channel blockers. They do not have significant direct cardiac activity. They only have very minimal uh, cardiac activity as such these calcium channel blockers. Uh, but what they do is that because of the peripheral vasodilatation, there will be reflex, uh, you know, secretion of uh, uh, catecholamines from the autonomic ganglia. And these uh, catecholamines act on myocardium and they cause reflex tachycardia and occasionally minimal bradycardia you know, is associated with nifidipine-like drugs and they also produce AV block, non-specific ST and T wave changes, calcium channel blockers, they are vasodilators. And then we have alpha blockers, alpha 1 blockers because we know that there are receptors alpha 1 and alpha 2 and alpha 1 receptor is present in the arterial smooth muscle, uh, drugs like prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin and tamsulosin. They are used in benign prostatic hypertrophy also, especially tamsulosin and doxazosin, whereas prazosin is mainly used in systemic hypertension. When there is a, you know, very severe elevation of uh, blood pressure and, um, you know, when we find it difficult to handle uh, systemic hypertension with routinely used drugs, we go for these alpha-1 blockers. They are very significant, you know, in reducing the blood pressure. And what they do in uh, the ECG is that they produce ventricular bradyarrhythmia, and tachyarrhythmia, first degree AV block. Then we have nitrates, unlike, you know, calcium channel blockers and, um, you know, uh, alpha-1 blockers, nitrates, they predominantly are venodilators. They dilate the veins, larger veins and also smaller veins and they act by releasing nitric oxide and they are used in angina pectoris. Um, see, when, when patients have a cardiac chest pain and we want to relieve the chest pain immediately, you know, we give nitrate sublingually and then, you know, it releases nitric oxide, produces venodilatation and reducing, you know, venous return, they reduce the cardiac workload and they reduce anginal chest pain. And what nitrates produce here in ECG is that, um, you know, they cause tachycardia and uh, otherwise, I mean, they are pretty safe, there is no significant uh, 
uh, you know, um, electrophysiological changes that we encounter with nitrates. Potassium channel openers, we have drugs like nicorandyl and minoxidil. Minoxidil is a potassium channel opener, uh, you know, rarely used in hypertension nowadays, but uh, it is found to be associated with increased hair growth and hence minoxidil um, as a lotion or, you know, as a liquid preparation, it is used in alopecia, you know, baldness, we are using minoxidil. But then it is a, you know, vascular smooth muscle uh, relaxant. Okay, and uh, you know it, it causes increased intracellular potassium and muscle relaxation, and what it does is that it causes uh, T wave changes and also shortening of QT interval, potassium channel openers. Then we have vasodilators, AC inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, drugs like keptopril, enalapril, and lisinopril, and then ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers like valsartan, telmisartan, herbisartan. You know, there are very many drugs that are used and now this is the class of drugs, both AC inhibitors and ARBs are very commonly used in hypertension. They are antihypertensives. They also have cardiac protective activity, okay, but then they do not have uh, much or uh, significant uh, electrophysiological changes, though rarely they produce QT prolongation, AV nodal block and then ST depression. Uh, they are considered to be pretty safe as far as heart is concerned, uh, AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Now we have uh, the last uh, category of drugs uh, in the indirectly acting are the drugs that act through reflex mechanisms producing ECG changes. We have ganglionic stimulants, autonomic ganglia, you know they have uh, parasympathetic uh, nerve supply and they act uh, by releasing acetylcholine and this acetylcholine will stimulate nicotinic receptor here. Uh, basically nicotinic receptors, there are two classes, uh, N, N type they act on neurons and then N, M type they act on skeletal muscles and here we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, nicotinic receptors present in the neurons, in the autonomic ganglia and stimulation of these ganglia will cause release of catecholamines, adrenaline and noradrenaline and they will stimulate myocardium to cause, you know, increased force of contraction and rate of contraction. Drugs like nicotine and uh, labelin, you know, they cause sometimes uh, release of catecholamines and uh, they produce ECG changes like sinus tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia. We have now, you know, non-specific mechanisms, non-cardiac medications, you know, we use um, like I, I was saying, you know, drugs for other purposes like, you know, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, antipsychotics, antidepressants, antihistamines or prokinetic drugs. All these drugs sometimes, you know, they are associated with uh, cardiac issues. Uh, they, they, they cause prolongation of QT intervals and they may produce ventricular arrhythmias. How they produce, the mechanisms are not very clear, but still uh, they mediate through multiple receptors. They, they produce interactions among various receptors and they may also be associated with the electrolyte abnormalities and other unknown mechanisms. They cause these electrolyte, I mean electrophysiological changes in the heart and they produce changes in the ECG. And there are drugs which were banned for their cardiovascular effects. You know, they were approved for some other indications, they were in the market, but later they have realized that they are associated with electrophysiological changes and significant cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and these drugs were banned. Drugs like terfenadine, um, it was used uh, for itching, for uh, running nose, okay. Astimazole again for allergy and hypersensitivity reactions, cisapride a prokinetic drug for gastrointestinal problems. They were all approved for their indications, but then later, uh, you know, the scientists have realized that they were associated with significant cardiovascular problems and they were all banned from the market. And these are the drugs which are already available in the market, but still they are associated with, uh, you know, uh, cardiac issues antibacterials, levofloxacin, even azithromycin has it, clarithromycin, erythromycin, many of the macrolide antibiotics have got this problem and antifungals like itraconazole or ketoconazole, antivirals, nelfinavir, they increase the QT interval. They are associated with significant cardio cardiovascular problems in case if the patient is already having a cardiac problem, then we need to be very careful when you are using these medications. Antidepressants like amitriptyline, imipramine and doxapine they cause QT prolongation and antipsychotics like haloperidol, resperidone and quetiapine, they cause, you know, this problem, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia in susceptible patients. Antiemetics like even ondansetron supposed to be a very safe drug has got this issue and domperidone, you know, they, they, they may cause QT prolongation and polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Now, the point is that why we need to know these things is that when, when 
we are using these medications in any other individual you know who is normal whose cardiac function is fine he doesn't have any morbidity then the the issue that these drugs are you know predisposing the patients may be very very minimal but if the patients after 50 years knowingly or unknowingly they may be having cardiovascular problems and if you are using these medications and you know we may predispose the patients to get into this uh, uh, you know arrhythmias and uh, you know we may unknowingly you know predispose them to get into this cardiovascular morbidity and mortality okay now what uh, finally we have is uh, drugs of abuse illicit drugs um, you know opioids for uh, unapproved indications we are using it people who are mixing these medications and liquor and they are drinking it and without knowing that these drugs have got significant cardiovascular uh, you know um, interactions opioids they may produce bradycardia and heroin is an opioid which can cause cardiac conduction abnormality and uh, many of these drugs are associated with uh, you know long qtc syndrome widening of the qrs complex hallucinogens like lysergic acid diethylamide they may produce tachycardia cocaine it can cause sinus bradycardia complete heart block we have seen patients who have abused cocaine you know getting into complete heart block then marijuana cannabis ganja you know tachycardia non specific st and t wave changes and amphetamines ecstasy like drugs sinus tachycardia supraventricular tachycardia so uh, without uh, you know uh, understanding the implications of uh, you know interaction of these drugs in the cardiovascular system people are abusing it i mean we need to strongly you know disagree with the practice of using these medications okay for that it also makes them to get into a lot of uh, psychological issues central nervous system issues and also cardiovascular problems okay now uh, we have almost come to the end of uh, this session what we have seen is that um, you know the drugs we have categorized into four types directly acting drugs indirectly acting drugs and then drugs through non specific mechanisms non cardiac medications affecting ecg and then drugs of abuse producing ecg changes why we need to know this is that number one um, which is very important you will have a drug which doesn't have this you know um, you know changes in the ecgs so you can always go back and then use an antibiotic in case if you are treating a cardiac patient who has got a respiratory infection instead of choosing azithromycin and levofloxacin we can use amoxicillin because amoxicillin is an antibiotic which is useful in respiratory infection but doesn't have significant ecg changes so the idea of giving this session is that we can we can choose drugs which are not having significant uh, you know uh, interaction with uh, you know cardiac receptors they they don't have you know uh, significant uh, you know uh, interaction with alpha beta or muscarinic receptor so they can be safely prescribed in a condition in which you can also you know prescribe a drug which has got significant ecg changes that's the point we would like to impress here that always try to choose a drug which doesn't have cardiovascular you know interactions in that way giving you an overview of uh, drugs which have got changes uh, you know in the ecg is to guide you in choosing a drug which will not hit the ecg this is point number 1 point number 2 if at all you want to use the same medicines which have got significant ecg changes you can be you know preparing the patient and also the physician can prepare himself in in handling an eventuality okay azithromycin can lead to increased uh, or prolongation of qt interval and if you are knowing the fact then you can prepare the patient and the physician also will prepare himself in handling the cardiovascular problems so these are the two points i think uh, as as a medical student or as a treating physician we need to know one is that choose a drug which doesn't affect ecg number one number two if at all we are choosing a medication which can cause ecg changes be prepare uh, yourself in handling the eventuality that's the idea of having this session in this you know program interpretation and application of ecg in clinical practice now before concluding i thought i will make a small remark on regulatory requirement of developing a drug if we develop a drug for a non cardiac purpose non arrhythmic purpose okay maybe an antibiotic maybe an analgesic maybe an antihistamine maybe uh, an antihypertensive medication uh, which is not indicated for arrhythmia if you have the idea of developing a drug now there is a guideline which which talks about every drug has to be evaluated for its action on qt interval because 
you know, we have seen many of the non-cardiac medications are affecting QT interval, okay, and hence uh, this ICH, ICH is the agency, like International Conference on Harmonization, this agency is giving guidelines on development of drug products, okay. They have given this guideline on efficacy 14, E14 guideline, which is titled like, you know, clinical evaluation of QT interval prolongation and pro-arrhythmic potential for non-anti-arrhythmic medications. Like any other medication which is not meant for arrhythmia, if you are developing, it is not just enough we are, we are evaluating the efficacy and safety in that particular indication. It is also very important that we need to test the drug for its potential to increase QT interval. So we have to do a thorough QT uh, study and also we need to have endpoints in the clinical trial so that uh, whatever drug that we are getting for the market is not having significant cardiovascular action, significant effect on the QT interval, okay. Why we are concerned about the cardiovascular uh, uh, effects? Because many of the non-cardiac drugs may also be associated with, uh, you know, significant morbidity like, you know, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or tosseries, deep pointers, a sudden cardiac death can happen in case if you are using those medications, if they are associated with significant, uh, you know, interaction in the ECG or, you know, QT interval, cardiac electrophysiology. And they may, you know, produce or they may predispose patients to get into ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation and flutter. They may produce syncopal attacks or sometimes seizures. In order to avoid all these complications, whenever we develop a drug, I think we need to make sure that the drugs are not having their actions on, you know, QT interval and also in the myocardial muscle and conducting system, okay. I think with this we have come to the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, the session was about drugs, drug effects on ECG, okay. I hope the session was useful to the beginners, especially the medical students and practicing physicians, um, you know, in, in giving, a, um, you know, a thought whenever they are choosing a medication, like I have already highlighted, try to choose a medication which is not having, uh, you know, any cardiovascular interaction or if at all we are forced to choose a medication which is having all these changes in the ECGs or interactions in the myocardial muscle and, uh, um, you know, conducting system, please be ready to handle any eventuality, okay. Uh, thank you very much for patient listening.